Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have my friend here, Adam, co-hosting the show with me. How are you doing on this Friday, Adam? Feeling like I got hit by a sunburst. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about. If you haven't heard the news lately, there is a lot going on in the world of cybersecurity. Last week, FireEye disclosed a breach that they were hacked by a nation state attacker. And we didn't mention it on our show last week, but it is big news because FireEye is a major player in the security space. They're paid to guard customers from breaches. They have an entire division working on threat intelligence. They're a multi-million dollar corporation in the information security space. And what they disclosed was that there was a nation state attacker that stole some of their red team tools that are used for pen testing customers. Luckily, there were no zero days that were included, and FireEye released a blog and a GitHub, which we'll link in the show notes, of countermeasures to detect these red team tools. Additionally, Checkpoint released a couple of vulnerabilities in a blog that were associated with the FireEye red team tools. I'll also link that in the show notes. Most notably, it also included the net logon or zero logon vulnerability that we had mentioned in our previous show that was a major vulnerability that had privilege escalation on domain controllers. So last week when this happened, the InfoSec Twitter was abuzz with this news. The majority of the InfoSec folks that I follow were extremely supportive of the FireEye incident response folks because we know what kind of day they were having. When you have that kind of day in in operation security, it's not a good day. So the majority of folks were very supportive. They were understanding because being attacked by a nation state can happen to anyone. However, there were a few folks that were kind of dunking on FireEye, being a security company and getting breached, kind of challenging them that you know this is something that shouldn't happen to a security company. Someone who focuses on information security and getting breached kind of ruins your reputation. And my thought was on this, that that's really not what we should be doing in the information security community. The it can't happen to me kind of attitude or the kind of kick them while they're down is not really the type of attitude we should have because there's not a whole lot that companies can do to protect themselves from nation state attackers. It's very difficult to completely prevent it. And I do want to mention since then, FireEye, in my opinion, has put on a clinic on incident response. They have been extremely transparent, very professional, and And the type of information that they're putting out per their investigation is extremely high quality. I'm fond of saying that information security is a team sport. And I work for one of the major information security vendors today at Microsoft, but there is no one vendor who can do it all or be it all. And as it turns out, without giving away the plot twist here in a moment, FireEye had a pretty good reason they got breached, as did a lot of organizations. Yeah, the other shoe basically dropped Sunday night. In our group chat between me and Adam, one of our friends had linked an article that I didn't actually pay a lot of attention to at the time. It just said that the U.S. Treasury and Commerce Department had been breached. And in my head, I thought, oh, okay, well, it's another breach. It's the Treasury and Commerce Department. Nothing that's too sensitive there. It's never good when a government agency gets breached, but I didn't think much of it. When I woke up in the morning, I followed my normal morning ritual and looked at my phone, scoured Twitter for a little bit, and I noticed I had a message from one of my former co-workers. And it was a link to another tweet that mentioned some sort of connection between SolarWinds, the Department of Commerce and Treasury, and FireEye. And so now the dots are starting to connect. And just a quick side note on this. I can't stress how important it is when you're in information security to kind of keep up networking with former co-workers who are in the space because a lot of that information as Adam said, is it's a community. We share that information. No one wants another organization to get breached. So it's important to keep up those networking relationships. Absolutely have a Twitter account, if nothing else, to just follow InfoSec people or InfoSec news. After I found the news that these were related, I remember that we use SolarWinds at our company. So I just send out a message to the networking team, just gathering information and asking them, what's the extent of our use of SolarWinds at our company? And if you know anything about SolarWinds Orion, which is the networking monitoring tool that was breached, if you use it, it's used very extensively. It monitors everything in your environment. 
Fortunately for us, we actually have two different domains and it was used on one of our domains that has less of our major resources and applications. Nevertheless, it was not on the most current version that was recommended for the patch. So we scrambled the folks that needed to patch it once we discovered that we use it. After we found out it had access to domain admin credentials, we knew that we had to make sure that it was at least patched before we started any type of investigation. Fortunately, because it was fairly limited in use on one domain, and then when we discovered that we didn't have any of the malicious DLLs, on top of the fact that this was a very targeted attack, we felt that we were fairly safe after the fire drill that we had in the morning. So Andy, that's a great anecdote of, of how you guys handled it at your organization. And I'm very relieved to hear that you didn't have some of the malicious DLLs in your installation. But FireEye did. So they discovered all the way back in March, as it turns out, that they had the SolarWinds Orion tool had become compromised. And that is what led to them becoming breached. And in fact, that's what led to many government agencies becoming breached. The Department of Treasury, Department of Commerce were kind of that first report that came out from Reuters later on, Department of Homeland Security, and even the Department of Energy, which includes the National Nuclear Security Administration, which manages our nuclear weapons stockpile. You know, no big deal. They all announced that they were succumbing to the breach as well. And this is really interesting because SolarWinds, they've now removed this from their website, but had at one point bragged very openly about how they had like 425 of the Fortune 500, and they have all five branches of the Department of Defense and practically every government agency or something like that. I mean, and this is super common, right? A lot of companies like to brag who uses their product. You'll see that kind of NASCAR kind of look where it's a bunch of logos everywhere. And by the way, as somebody who is a security seller, a lot of organizations won't do this. You can get a big win at a very large customer. And a lot of them will say, we don't, we don't want to tell people what we use. And this might be kind of more fuel for that fire that it might not be a good idea for security vendors as well as individual enterprises to announce so openly what they use because this basically was a roadmap to attackers of, hey, SolarWinds, everybody uses it. Look, it's right on their website. Here's all the people we could breach if we could compromise their source code, which is exactly what happened. So all this happened kind of Monday, Monday morning, and then CISA came out. Remember CISA? We talked about them a couple of weeks ago with the unceremonious termination of Chris Krebs, their leader. By the way, wouldn't it be great if they had someone in leadership right now. Anyhow, I don't want to get political, but CISA issued an emergency order that was not messing around, to put it lightly. Andy, what what did that order say? All major agencies who are affected shall immediately disconnect and power down SolarWinds Orion products and prohibit joining of any Windows host OS to the enterprise domain. And then all CIOs had to submit a report to CISA by 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on that Monday, attesting that it was done. Like I said, not messing around. Yeah, so we're not going to talk too much about the technical details, but we'll give you a high-level overview. How did this really happen? And FireEye has a great technical presentation that we'll put in the show notes on all the technical details behind it. But essentially, there was a malicious SolarWind update that inserted some malicious code into a legitimate software update that allowed an attacker remote access into any victim's environment. And it was really funny, as a side note, I told my wife about the breach, and when I said it was done through an update... Her comment was, that's why I never update. <laughs> that's obviously the wrong answer. We want to patch. And, and we'll get into what to do later on to mitigate some of these breaches. But not patching and not updating is, is not the right answer. And what was really interesting about this breach in general was the attacker was very patient. They were extremely stealthy. They didn't use a lot of malware that would trip off AVs. And they went to significant lengths to try to hide their activity and blend into the normal network activity. They sat dormant for a little while. They didn't beacon to anywhere. And today, there was actually even more reporting that the attackers did a dry run back in October of 2019, where they inserted a malicious update with no backdoor. And it's being theorized that they were trying to test to see if they would get caught using this. So they were extremely methodical. They tested the waters without beaconing, without a backdoor, without any use of malware. And when they didn't get caught, they dropped the actual malicious update in March. The file name is solarwinds.orion.core.businesslayer.dll. And it was digitally signed by SolarWinds on March 24th and incorporated into the update. And once it was installed, computer systems by customers were essentially trojanized and they would start beaconing after a little while 
file to malicious command and control IPs. And the attackers even went at length to use VPN servers located in the victim's country of origin to avoid detection. You know, Andy, one interesting thing to point out here, too, with these customer systems installing this DLL that was digitally signed, which means it came from the vendor, the vendor signed it, Uh, you can validate cryptographically that it came from the vendor. If you trust the vendor, you're going to trust this DLL. So there's been some hand wringing here on like, what could we do differently? And honestly, this is not something you should really focus on from a perspective of how could we catch this next time? This is kind of a perfect storm where based on how we trust things, there's no way to detect that. But one thing that I came across that was interesting is that SolarWinds specifically told customers to exclude it from their antivirus software. This was guidance given by SolarWinds ostensibly for performance reasons to prevent performance degradation. But either way, when this beaconing started spinning up and these Trojans started doing their thing, they had the extra cover that this software vendor had told customers, don't let your antivirus software scan what we're doing. And that's kind of bananas too, that everything we had stood up to this point really enabled them to operate under the cloak of darkness. And I guess that's a lesson we could potentially learn going forward is should we exclude software from antivirus detections? Should we exclude software from EDR solutions? I can't really think of a good reason to do that. I mean, the performance thing maybe, but that's that's a huge risk. And that certainly enabled some of this to happen undetected as well. I saw some commentary on Twitter about this too. It's a fairly common practice to ask customers to exclude different products from AV scanning. Yes. Not to say that it's the right thing to do, but it is very common in many IT management systems, things that are highly trusted. But I guess the question is more, instead of just answering, should we do this? I think the question should be more along the lines of what is the risk if we do this? And if the product requires this to work, is this something we should be buying from a customer standpoint? From a vendor standpoint, absolutely. I think you should be asking, can we make the product work without having to do this, right? Going forward, because I think customers are going to be asking themselves, should we be excluding your product from AV scanning? And then from a customer standpoint, if I have one product here that requires it and one product that doesn't, I'm probably going to go with the product that doesn't require me to circumvent my security controls. You know, on the same note, it would be a lot easier if you just put your firewall wide open too. <laughs> I mean, why, why, why mess with all that hassle? Just, just throw it open. It'll be fine. Do it just for us. We're, we're the only vendor asking you to do it. I mean, to me, that's, that's essentially kind of the same ask. And it's not a good answer on that side either. If your vendor can't clearly disclose host names and ports that their software needs to use. There was some more reporting that kind of furthered our understanding of how the attackers got a hold of an update. It was discovered by an independent researcher that there was an update server on the public internet for SolarWinds that was protected by the password SolarWinds123, all lowercase. And obviously, that's not a good thing. And going back several months, the attackers could have used Shodan to look for certain open public servers. And when they come across something like SolarWinds, that's obviously going to look like a, a very juicy target. And if you have a poor password protecting it, that becomes catastrophic in this case. So after all this news broke, what should you do as a security defender? And we'll kind of break it up into a couple different sections. So immediately, you should patch your SolarWinds Orion server if you are using SolarWinds Orion to 20.20.2.1HF2, which was released on December 16th on Wednesday. The immediate guidance was to upgrade to HF1, but then SolarWinds released HF2 as well. So if you haven't done that, you must immediately do that. And if you can't do that, I'd recommend isolating your SolarWinds server if you can, or powering it down until you can. You should also check for IOCs in your environment. In the show notes, in the FireEye technical breakdown, there's going to be IOCs in there, different DLL hashes that you can look for. Your AV vendor most likely will already have these built into the threat feed, but you want to check that. You want to check your network and your DNS logs for avsvmcloud.com any calls to that. That was the command and control malicious domain that was beaconing with the DLL. Fortunately, with a collaborative effort between FireEye, GoDaddy, and Microsoft, Microsoft now owns that domain and basically sinkholes all the traffic that goes into that domain. So it's no longer beaconing for the attackers. 
You should also look for any type of newly created privileged accounts because SolarWinds uses generally a domain admin account. It has full administrative privileges to your domain. It can create all types of other accounts to stay persistent in the environment. So take a look at that. And if you have any credentials, especially if you have any of the IOCs that are mentioned above, you should consider rotating them because those credentials or anything associated with SolarWinds are most likely compromised. And on that same note as credentials, private keys or secrets as well, same thing. You should assume the attackers have all your private keys, all of that stuff. And as we understand public private key cryptography, that means attackers can forge things with your private key that you would trust if you don't rotate it. So I saw as an example where a customer, and this was not a a Microsoft customer, had been compromised for actually a couple of years, which is amazing dwell time for the attackers. Like, you were talking about Andy, very patient. And they were pushed out of the environment, but they got back in because they were essentially able to forge a cookie that bypassed a duo MFA requirement. And that's just a perfect example of when I possess those secrets or those private keys, I can forge things, which let me back in. And so kind of on that note, the NSA released some guidance and it's excellently written. We will link to it in the show notes. And it makes several suggestions on how to harden your identity infrastructure, because as we're fans of saying on this show, identity is the new control plane for security. And they make several recommendations. And just to summarize them briefly, they want you to really look at securing your privileged access, whether that's through using just in time, just enough access, standing up privileged access workstations, those sorts of things. Also, if you use Azure AD or an equivalent IDP, make sure you're looking at any like OAuth style applications or service principles that are requesting additional access. Make sure they're valid and if not, get rid of them. Disable legacy authentication. That's kind of a Microsoft concept where I can log in with just textual based username and password. Obviously, we want more than that. MFA, all the things. Obviously, MFA is super important and you should have it turned on for everything, but especially all your administrative accounts. And then a super interesting call out that they made. And as a security seller at Microsoft, I've been trying to get my customers to do this for many years, but it sure doesn't hurt that now I have the NSA literally telling you to do this. Their guidance is you should not run run any sort of federated identity provider on premises if you at all can. For example, ADFS. You should get rid of it and you should migrate everything to Azure AD was their guidance in this documentation, which is kind of amazing. But their rationale and reason why is when you have those on-premises identity providers or, or federated providers in particular, again, attackers can steal stuff like private keys and secrets, and they can use them to forge SAML tokens that might give them access to cloud resources. Essentially, when you have that connection where you're using federated authentication to authenticate to a cloud resource. Now, if your on-premises infrastructure becomes compromised, I can use that on-premises compromise to now go compromise your cloud as well. And so the idea here is basically eliminate that linkage, make it all cloud. And now the attackers would not only have to compromise on-prem, but they'd have to compromise your cloud all over again. And I think this is something we'll touch on a little bit later, but Microsoft put out a blog post that is going to raise a couple of eyebrows because essentially we've spent the last seven years or so as the growth of Microsoft 365 has happened in the enterprise. And it essentially suggests you kind of walk back a lot of those linkages between on-premises and the cloud. So for example, they would say that any synchronized identity that comes from on-premises should not have any sort of elevated privilege. All of your elevated privileged accounts should be cloud-only accounts as one example. Another example is they recommend moving entirely away from device management concepts where a device has an on-premises component to its device management. You go fully cloud, Azure AD join, which we've talked about before too. So I don't want to get away into that. We'll link it in the show notes, but it just shows how this current conversation is really turning a lot of our thought processes on their head where we really need to change the way we think about things. And this is a really interesting concept of we've spent so many years kind of creating these hybrid opportunities where we have some things on premises, some things in the cloud. And it turns out that hybrid, all this stuff just really means we're linking the two together and then they can become compromised in one fell swoop. And if we isolate them instead, then we make it harder for attackers to get to all the things. And I think that's a really interesting concept to come out of this that is maybe going to get a lot of traction, although it will take time. Yeah, that's definitely something that people can put on their roadmap and strategize for what to do going forward. 
Agreed. That blog post, by the way, if if you click on anything in the show notes, click on that because it, like I said, it's really going to raise eyebrows for you because conceptually, if you have a Microsoft 365 environment today, it's going to turn a lot of the things you do on your head. When I was showing it to Andy before we started recording the show, his response was, whoa, this is really far above and beyond what almost any enterprise is doing today. I mean, that's kind of how far out there this is. This is, I would say 99% of enterprises are not in this model maybe even less than that. So it's super interesting and maybe gives people a North Star to drive toward. And going forward, as Adam mentioned, a supply chain attack is extremely hard to detect. There's really not a whole lot that organizations can do to try to prevent something from this from happening because SolarWinds is a highly trusted component of your infrastructure. It has domain admin credentials, unfettered access into all of your systems. So if that becomes compromised, there's not a whole lot you can do. It's very similar to the conversation we had about AV. Most AV products are extremely trusted on your workstation. They have kernel level access. They are integrated into the networking components of workstations, the processes that are being run, they inspect everything that is there. And if that AV component becomes compromised, then they have unfettered access to your workstation. So I wouldn't focus on what you can do to prevent something like this from happening, but there are a lot of good practices that you should be doing. For example, patching. We've mentioned patching before, but definitely patch. We said it on this show, don't follow my wife's example by saying, it's a good thing I don't patch, so we didn't get the malicious patch. You should be patching. Isn't your wife a physician? She is. (laughs) You should have turned around and told her, I don't get the flu shot because it gives me the (laughs) flu. Exactly. Maintenance is, is a good thing on all things. The human body, IT systems, you should be doing the maintenance. Routine maintenance saves lives, saves IT systems. But most breaches occur because of misconfigurations and vulnerabilities on non-patched systems. So make sure you're patching. Be careful what information you put out there publicly. Adam mentioned that SolarWinds had a list of customers on their sites, which is now removed, but it gave them the attackers a roadmap of potential targets. Any type of information that you put out there is open source intelligence. We've mentioned that on the show before. It is reconnaissance. Attackers will do this and scope their targets out. You should be very conscious of what type of information for your company and for yourself that you put out there on the public internet. We also talked about already what security compromises that you have to have when you get new products. If a product is going to ask for exceptions into your AV or exceptions into GPO restrictions, full fettered access with a domain admin account, you should really ask yourself, one, do they need that access? Do they need those exceptions? And two, do we really need this product if that's what they're asking for? You should have some sort of vendor security review process built in. Hopefully other parts of your organization just aren't going out there and buying different products without security having a review of it. I think there's an argument to be made here as well for vendor consolidation. And I know this is a trend that's been going on in information security for a while, because again, as as somebody who sells a security platform, I know we used to throw out some crazy number, like the average enterprise has something like 80 different security tools from 60 different vendors or something absurd like that. It's crazy. This is definitely an argument for vendor consolidation just because it reduces your attack surface. You know, we talked about you can't directly like detect or prevent this kind of supply chain chain attack when you're going to trust it because it's digitally signed by the vendor. However, you can have fewer vendors, which means there's fewer places for them to get hit with a supply chain attack. And ultimately, I often hear the concern about, you know, putting all my eggs in one basket. Breaching is kind of a binary thing. Either you got breached or you didn't. So you can't get more breached because you put all your eggs in one basket. I guess, so to speak. So I think there's an argument to be made too to consolidate your number of vendors because that reduces, again, the risk downstream there. And so that might be another part of your vendor review as you're going through that process to consider is it might just be better to have a couple of trusted vendors that you do most of your work with. And of course, that's kind of hilariously bad advice when we talk about solar winds because in all honesty, they're kind of the only game in town in that space. I mean, they are the gold standard. That's why they had so many customers, uh, 425 of the Fortune 500 or whatever. They're the best. So it's really hard in that space, but I think there's other opportunities for consolidation. Another thing to do is definitely look at your privileged service accounts. SolarWinds uses a service account that has generally domain admin credentials. A lot of security tools will ask for this. You should ask yourself, are you limiting the rights of those? Because I guarantee you that service account for SolarWinds doesn't need RDP rights. It probably doesn't need interactive logon. It's most likely using PowerShell and WMI to run the commands that it needs for its reporting. And while limiting the use and the rights of a domain admin 
the account may not stop attackers, it might slow them down. So in the spirit of least privileged access, that's what I would recommend reviewing is even if it has domain admin credentials, does it actually need all the things that come with domain admin? And we've talked about it on our ransomware episodes, but pen testing, you should be conducting external pen tests, either through some sort of vendor, or if you have the resources to stand up an internal red team, you should invest in that. The publicly accessible server should have been discovered in a pen test by SolarWinds if they were regularly checking Pen testing is super important, big fan of it, and I know it's expensive, but there's no better way to find out the real world vulnerabilities and weaknesses in your organization than having somebody professionally look for them in, of course, an ethical manner. And that kind of takes us along to passwords. And so, Andy, it was kind of almost a laugh out loud moment earlier when you mentioned that that SolarWinds update server literally had a password of SolarWinds123. And I know you're tired of hearing about it, but seriously, use good passwords. You can use Azure AD password protection to enforce strong passwords. It'll automatically block the most common passwords in Azure AD. What you can also do is do a custom banned password list. And of course, you're going to include your company name in that. Don't let people use the company name in their passwords. Password. And so if SolarWinds had done that, hopefully it would have caught this and prevented them from setting the password that way in the first place. And then another thing, and I kind of touched on this earlier with the advice from the NSA, where they're literally telling you to get rid of ADFS. Another plug for that as well, sync your password hashes to Azure AD instead. This gives you a ton of benefits, high availability. It also gets rid of that federated infrastructure on premises that attackers can use to forge SAML tokens and do bad things with that. And it enables you to get detected if if a password gets dumped on the dark web and your user happened to reuse their password, you will get notified of that. And you can even, depending on your licensing level, set up automated remediation. So password hash synchronization in Azure AD, million times better than having federated authentication at this point. And now you literally have the NSA telling you to stop doing that. So I feel vindicated in a way because I've been banging this drum for a couple of years. And that should take us right up to an incident response plan. Yeah, we talked about incident response in our ransomware episode as well. So I won't totally hash this out, but you should have one, even if it's just a few steps. Think through what would happen if you got breached today, what you would have to do, who you have to notify, what communications have to go out, what tools you have to scan, what level of incident requires you to start that chain. And even if it's just a, a note that these are the things we're going to do, have one and practice it. Be ready to put it into action. For example, my mind when I started responding to this immediately went into incident response and I started documenting the steps that I were taking and the timestamps of what was happening, who I communicated with, just in case I had to rehash that later on in some sort of after actions report. So recording the steps, communicating it out, making sure that the right people are notified and then remediating it and then the investigation afterwards. So make sure you have an incident response plan. Think about what you're going to do and be ready. And one of the final things I want to just talk about with this whole incident is one of the information security professionals that we've mentioned was a gentleman who worked for Maersk during the not Petya ransomware incident. And serendipitously, he found me on LinkedIn as part of one of our posts for this podcast. And we linked up and he put out a blog on the incident, which I'll link in the show notes. But what was really interesting about it was he actually linked to a Microsoft blog where they talked about organizations having to work together and sharing insights and resources between the business, technical and security teams so that you can leverage diverse viewpoints and experiences. And we've talked about this where security teams must integrate themselves and be good communicators. And in his blog, he kind of mentions that as security professionals, we know what can happen. We watch the news. We see it happen to organizations. We know what is required in order to protect against the threats out there. But sometimes we may not be good at communicating what needs to be done. Sometimes because security may be heavy handed in their methods, we may not have a very good relationship with the broader IT community. And because of that, we don't have a seat at the table. But but that needs to change. We need to have good communication skills. We need to try to insert ourselves into the conversation. And we need to make sure that everyone in IT, from application owners, system administrators, directors who are making budget decisions, business leaders, that they're thinking and baking security into everything that we do, that it becomes part of their process because we can't do this on our own. And as an example of this, just today, I had someone reach out to me that said, hey, I saw this application, a remote access application 
application installed on a server. And that seems funny to me. And when I went to investigate it, there were a bunch of misconfigurations on the server. It was highly vulnerable. And it all began with a guy who was not in security, raising the question, seeing something that was not normal and just raising it to my attention saying, I saw this. This whole chain of events here was probably due to some analyst at FireEye seeing something and thinking, hmm, SolarWinds shouldn't be doing this. That looks weird. I wonder what it is. And it set this whole thing off. So just make sure we're collaborating and communicating and working as a team. As we mentioned right from the start, Adam said it, security is a team sport. And that includes the business owners, the other technical folks in the community outside of security as well. I worked in IT before I joined Microsoft, and I joined Microsoft. My initial title was Technology Solutions Professional, Enterprise Mobility, and Security. Security was literally in my title. And prior to joining Microsoft, the team I worked for was the end user computing team. So I was responsible for delivering the experience for end users to help them get their work done, to help them be productive. And that is where I spent most of my IT career, was in the productivity end user computing side of the house. But I got hired by Microsoft to to do security. And let me tell you, at that last place before I came here, I hated security team because the problem was I saw them as nothing more than a roadblock. I was not trying to do things in an insecure way. I understood how to do things the right way. They could have added additional value, but instead they were Dr. No. Their purpose there was to obstruct, say no, and be a problem. And that doesn't help anyone be successful. They had this person who literally said, that they did not trust the security on a smartphone and gave a whole bunch of like really goofy reasons why. Now, of course, smartphones, generally speaking, Android and iOS have a stronger security model than do desktop PCs because all the code they run is trusted. They have very limited capabilities to run untrusted code. Every application is sandboxed. So when somebody in a reasonable leadership position says something like that, they lose all credibility. And it was just really a pretty horrendous experience. And that makes it really hard to deliver on all of these goals Mr. Ashton is talking about. When we're not able to integrate with them, we're trying to do the right thing, and they literally like almost get their jollies from being a roadblock. And so don't be that information security team. We absolutely do need to strengthen and secure our organizations, but we need to do it in a collaborative fashion. How can information security add value to the other projects? How can they help be integrated early and often to help deliver a productive and secure experience. Because there's oftentimes this, this, there's the perception that productivity and security are at odds. And I don't buy into that. I think you can have both if you do it right. And so the security team should be measured on how productive they make the enterprise while also keeping them secure. And so think of ways to do that. I've heard extreme examples where you know information security should be measured by like the boot time or the login time of the endpoint computing experience. And maybe that's extreme, but that's kind of the things we should be thinking about where keep the organization secure, but do it in a way that integrates with the larger goals of the business and everyone else. And so I know I'm kind of on a soapbox rant here a little bit, but everything Andy, you just talked about really resonates with me. And I just had a really bad experience in my mouth on how that went down in the past, because to me, that's exactly the wrong way to go about it. And to be fair too, I think this has really improved. I think that mindset really was kind of a 2016 mindset. And I think in 2020, information security teams have gotten a lot better. They've moved away from that Dr. No kind of mindset and really have worked towards how they can help other teams get to yes, how they can help them get to where they want to be, but doing it in a secure manner. And so those are the kind of things I think about when I think about information security, getting that seat at the table and being integrated in the project process or app dev process early and often. You have to be an enabler, not a roadblock. If you're a roadblock, Roadblock, people are going to find a way to get around the roadblock. They're not going to find a way to make the roadblock part of their strategy. Well said, Adam. And that's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed listening. As always, our contact information, both Twitter and LinkedIn, are in the show notes. Reach out to us if you have any security topics that you want us to discuss or have any questions. Thanks and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.